This is a review for the Agricultural Tree Crop Pesticide Applicator License. I'm Juanita Papineau and I am reviewing you as the commercial fruit agent for Orange Lake and Marion counties. The Agricultural Tree Crop Pest Control Applicator is an individual license to use or supervise the use of restricted use pesticides in the production of agricultural tree crops, including citrus, pecan, blueberries, peaches, and more. The license can be either commercial or public. There is not a private license. If you are doing this for just your own farm, you would use a private applicator license, not the agricultural tree crop license. This does not include the use or supervision of restricted use fumigant pesticides. The agricultural tree crop license requires recertification every four years. You may either take the exam again every four years or you can get the continuing education units required to renew this. You will need eight continuing education units in ag tree crop category and four in the core category to renew. The licensing of restricted use pesticide applicators is regulated by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services or FDACs. Restricted use pesticides are only for retail sale to and use by certified applicators or persons under their direct supervision. It is only for those purposes covered by the applicator's certification. So it's very specific about what your license allows you to apply them to. And records of applications are required. You must keep records of all restricted use pesticides that you use. The label should say restricted use pesticide right at the very top of the label. It's pretty clear that that is a restricted use pesticide. The label may also include the reason for the classification in this example due to acute toxicity, but it's not required. Bromazil is a pesticide that has some specific regulations different from others. They are called state specific regulations because this chemical is highly mobile in sandy soils with little organic matter, which is most of Florida. It is a groundwater threat because of that and also because it has a two to eight month half-life. That means only half of it will be gone in eight months or two to eight months. And so it can last for a very long time in the environment. You need to check the label for where it is prohibited and be very careful when you're using this chemical. You may have noticed on the slides that the letters in yellow indicate something that's very important for you to know. And the information here about label signal words is all very important to know. Label signal words indicate approximately how acutely toxic the pesticide is to humans by ingestion. It is based on the entire contents of the product, not just the active ingredient alone. It does not indicate the risk of delayed or allergic effects. And danger due to skin and eye irritation potential will not carry the word poison or the skull and crossbones. But if you see danger poison, it is likely to cause acute illness through oral, dermal, or inhalation exposure. Records of restricted use pesticide applications are required, and they must include the name and license number of the licensee responsible for application, the name of the person who applied the pesticide, because remember you can supervise people to apply for you, the date, start time, and end time of treatment, the location of the treatment site. You can use GPS coordinates, the legal plat, or the USDA ID number for the field. The target crop, the application method, the total area treated, the total amount applied, the brand name and EPA registration number, the name of the person authorizing or a statement of authority to make application if made to property not owned or leased by licensee, and this must be recorded no later than two working days after the application and retained for two years. That's a lot of records to keep. There are actually example forms in the back of your study guide and available online that you can make copies of, so you can be sure to keep records of all of this information. In this next section, we will go over pest identification because identification is key to control. We will cover some arthropods, weeds, plant diseases, nematodes, and vertebrates. Remember that what we will go over are just some examples. It is not all of the information that you'll need to know for your specific crop. Arthropods are one of the largest groups in the animal kingdom. 
Arthropod means jointed foot because of the external skeleton and jointed body parts of these creatures. They are important pests of tree crops, including insects and mites. Insects are not all bad, though. Insects of ecological importance are 99% of all insects. Only 1% are problem insects. There are plenty of good ones as well. Beneficial insects include predators, parasites that feed on harmful insects, and mites and weeds that can help you to control your arthropod problems. Pest identification is sometimes by seeing the insect and sometimes by only seeing the damage. The damage you'll see is consistent with the type of mouth part of the insect, and that can sometimes help us identify or narrow down what insect is causing the problem. For example, piercing sucking insects that have a piercing sucking mouth part cause small spots where they insert the stylus and withdraw fluid. White flies and scales are both examples of this type of insect and damage. Chewing insects like ants, beetles, caterpillars, and grasshoppers will chew either along the edges or through the middle of leaves, and that can be very diagnostic for what type of pest is causing your problem. The insect life cycle is considered a metamorphosis because of their external skeleton. As they grow, they have to keep shedding that external skeleton and creating a new larger insect. And this can be considered complete if they go from an egg to a larvae to a pupa to an adult, or it can be considered gradual if they start from an egg and then go to nymph, which just gets to larger and larger, but they always look kind of like the adult that they will become. Complete metamorphosis has a complete change from a caterpillar to something like a butterfly with that pupil stage in between. But complete or gradual is considered metamorphosis because the insect changes as it grows. Insects and mites are quite different and require different pest control measures. Insects have three body segments and six legs. Mites or arachnids have two body regions eight legs, and they require those different chemicals to control them. This includes spiders, ticks, and mites. Mites are not insects. They are arthropods, but they are quite distinct from insects. And insecticides often will not work on mites. You'll need a miticide. So it's important to be able to distinguish between mites and insects. Mites are usually very small. Most are quite microscopic. They occupy a wide range of ecological niches, and they usually have four pairs of legs rather than the three pairs that insects have. However, immatures may have fewer. Some mites will produce fine webbing from silk glands like spider mites. They have a gradual metamorphosis life cycle. The immature resembles the adult and is just smaller. Some examples here are the citrus rust mite, which is very difficult to see, but causes this black surface on the shady side of oranges. Weeds are also pest to tree crop production. And it's important to understand the weed life cycle so that you can target the proper herbicide or control measures for that weed without wasteful applications. The three life cycles are annual, biennial, and perennial. In the annual life cycle, the plant goes from seed to growth, maturity, and production of seed in 12 months or less. Some examples are crabgrasses and broadleaf signal grass. Annuals may be warm season annuals or cool season annuals. And it's important for you to understand that if you apply a herbicide to a warm season annual at the end of the warm season, it's kind of a wasted application. So it's important to identify whether it's an annual weed or one of the others. Biennial weeds have a two-year life cycle. They're vegetative the first year, they flower and produce seeds in the second year. And an example is cutleaf evening primrose. It's important with biennial weeds that you control them in that first year before they go to seed. Perennial weeds live more than two years. They may die back to the roots in the winter, but they will come back every year getting larger and more difficult to control every year. 
Examples are Bermuda grass and Johnson grass. In controlling weeds, it's important to determine if you have a broadleaf weed, a grass, or a sedge. Broadleaf weeds are pretty easy to distinguish from grasses and sedges because they have broad netted veins, but grasses and sedges can often be difficult to distinguish. The grass has a hollow round stem, as seen on the far right hand side, whereas sedges have a triangular solid stem, as seen in the middle picture, and the leaves are arranged in groups of three. Grasses and sedges are quite different in herbicide susceptibility, and it's important to understand how they grow. There are many ways to control weeds, including tillage or cultivation, mowing, exclusion by using plastic or organic mulch, burning. Some crops, they actually flood the weeds out. There's biological control, but this is usually for very specific weeds only. There are cover crops to suppress weeds. And finally, there's chemical control. Chemical control of weeds requires knowledge of terminology for proper selection of the type of herbicide that you're going to use. Contact herbicides are herbicides that will burn on contact with the leaves and just kill that part of the plant. Translocated herbicides are herbicides that are absorbed by the plant and translocated around in the plant, including to any plantlets that are attached through roots or rhizomes to that plant. And so it can kill the more thoroughly kill the whole plant. Selective herbicides are ones that will only kill specific types of plants. So for example, a sedge herbicide or a grass herbicide or a broadleaf weed herbicide, and it will not kill the other types of plants. Non-selective herbicides will kill any type of plant. Persistent herbicides are ones that will last for a long time in the environment, whereas non-persistent herbicides are ones that are broken down in the environment pretty quickly. You may think that a persistent herbicide would be the best choice because you don't have to apply it as often, but it can be very dangerous to the environment if it gets off target. And sometimes it's bad for you if you've applied it to a field that you later on decide to do uh, with a different crop. Foliar herbicides are applied to the leaves. Soil applied herbicides are applied to the soil. Post-emergent herbicides are ones that are applied after the weed seeds have germinated and the plants are growing. Pre-emergent herbicides are ones that are applied to clean soil before the weeds have germinated and form a barrier to keep those weeds from germinating. Plant disease is a problem that you may encounter in tree fruit production, and it's important to determine what is causing the disease so that you can target that disease and choose the proper control. Diseases may be seen as symptoms where you just see the effect of the disease on the plant, like spots, blight, galls, wilts, rots, or slow growth, but this doesn't tell you exactly what disease organism is causing the problem. Signs are when you see the actual disease organism itself. This may be as rust spores, as mushrooms, or bacterial ooze. It's important to be able to tell what the disease is so that you can make a choice for control. Diseases may be caused by fungi, by bacteria, by virus, or it may be abiotic. That means it is a condition, not something that's living that's causing that problem. So it may be salt or cold that causes a symptom that looks similar to a plant disease, but is not. And it's important to understand if it is caused by a fungus, fungus, a bacteria, or a virus because the control measures are different for each. To have plant disease problems, you have to have a susceptible host, a favorable environment, and the pathogen present. This is called the disease triangle. If you don't have all three of these, you will not have a disease. So you can choose hosts that are not susceptible to disease, and even though the pathogen is there and the environment is favorable, you will have no disease. Likewise, you can change the environment so that the susceptible host and the pathogen are not causing a problem. Or you can kill off the pathogen or exclude that pathogen so that you don't have this problem. 
Fungi obtain their nutrients from some organic source, whether it's living or dead. Most live off of dead organic matter. These are rot organisms that are saprophytes, not parasites. Parasites are fungus that live on live trees and cause disease. Most have a vegetative body, which is called a mycelium, which are tiny filamentous strands or hyphae, as seen in this photograph on the right. The hyphae grow through infected host and move the rot or the problem caused by the fungus through the plant. Fungi have spores and they have more than one type. Some are resting structures that allow the fungus to exist in dead plant material or in the soil with the spores just waiting to be released when conditions are favorable, causing secondary spread, as well as reproductive spores. You can see a photograph in the upper right of mushroom fungi releasing spores into the air to spread that fungus around. Fungi are identified by the mycelium and the fruiting bodies, and often you cannot identify it unless you have a fruiting body. Fungi growth is accelerated by high humidity, warm temperatures, and water on the leaves. It's one of the reasons why we talk about avoiding overhead irrigation to avoid water on the leaves. Bacteria are microscopic single-celled organisms. The plant infecting ones are rod shaped and most have flagella or that little tail as seen in the upper right hand corner to propel them through liquids. That's why bacteria often require water on the leaves to spread around. Most require warmth and moisture to multiply. Symptoms of bacterial infection include galls, leaf spots, wilts, blights, chlorotic tissue and rots. The photograph below shows crown gall, which is an agrobacterium that spreads through wounds to the tissue, either through pruning or grafting, and can cause a lot of problems there with those tumor-like growths. Most bacteria are spread by contact, whether it's on wind-driven rain, irrigation, tools, insects, birds, or even people's clothing. An example is the Asian citrus psyllid carries huanglongbing or citrus greening, HLB. This insect inserts its mouth part into an infected tree, pulls up some sap with that bacteria, and when it moves to another tree, it inserts that mouth part and can spread bacteria that way. Bacteria also invade plant material through wounds or openings. For example, citrus canker, which can often enter through leaf miner holes, or xylella or ralstonia. Viruses are much smaller than even bacteria. They depend on other living organisms for materials and reproduction. It's often difficult to distinguish between diseases caused by bacteria, viruses, and fungus. The photo in the top right hand corner is an example of citrus mosaic virus. Positive diagnosis of viruses requires laboratory tests because they are so small. They are commonly spread by mites or other plant feeding insects. Symptoms that you might see include stunted plants, altered plant natural color, or abnormal plant formation. And an example below is of Citrus tristeza virus, which causes this stem pitting. Viroids are even smaller than viruses because they lack a protein coat. They suspect that viroids cause many plant disorders, but it's not confirmed because they are so small and difficult to isolate. Viroids are spread primarily through infected stock, infected plant sap on hands or tools. Some examples are exocortis and cachexia. The symptoms of exocortis cause dwarfing and bark scaling as you can see in the upper right hand corner of the rootstock of a citrus tree. Cachexia, also called xyloporosis, causes severe pitting and gumming in the bark. Abiotic disorders are caused by something in the environment and not by a living pathogen. 
however the symptoms may look the same as from disease and so it's important to determine was the problem caused by abiotic disorder or by a pathogen where you can use some kind of control measure some examples of abiotic disorders are mechanical damage from a mower as seen above or nutrient deficiency as seen below which looks very similar to a disease of hlb or greening in citrus it could also be cold damage or salt damage that causes burning on the edges of the leaves which looks like some kind of disease it's important to determine if the problem is abiotic or biotic nematodes are another tree crop pest that may be difficult to determine and control nematodes are small usually microscopic roundworms the ones that feed on plants have a needle-like mouth part called a stylet. They move with eel-like motion in thin water films and can be spread on footwear, tools, and equipment. Their life cycle goes from an egg through several larval stages to an adult. A cyst is an inactive resistant form that can last for years in the soil. Most nematodes do not kill the tree. They cause a reduction in vigor, growth, and productivity with a thinning of the canopy and twig dieback. It's important to determine if you have a nematode problem because it can have a big impact on your productivity. Examples of major economic importance to citrus are the citrus nematode, which causes a slow decline, and the burrowing nematode, which causes a spreading decline. But there are many types of nematodes that will affect different fruit crops. Vertebrates can also be pests in the orchard because everybody likes fruit. Vertebrates have a jointed backbone. They include mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Some vertebrates, such as birds, rodents, raccoons, feral hogs, and deer, will injure agricultural tree crops and cause problems with food safety. Amphibians occasionally will clog filters, pipes, and irrigation equipment. In the exam, you will have to identify some pests by photograph. This first one is a citrus white fly, which is obviously a fly with just two wings and is white, but the immature forms of a citrus white fly may not be so obvious. They look more like a clear scale or a greenish scale insect, but they're just the immature citrus white fly. Grasshoppers can also cause problems on tree fruit. The lubber grasshopper is easily identified because of its large size and distinctive coloration as seen in that lower right hand corner of an adult. However, the younger lubber grasshoppers are smaller and differently colored and so may not be apparent as lubber grasshoppers. When they are first emerges from eggs, they are black with a red to yellow stripe and they get larger keeping that different coloration from the adult until they become an adult. The green stink bug can be a big problem on tree fruit and is sometimes difficult to identify because of the variety of coloration and shapes as it goes through its life stages as seen here, going from a very small brown insect through a black spotted colorful finally to a solid green insect. There are many beneficial insects and it's important to identify those and realize that they are good for you and not bad and make sure that you're targeting your pest control so that it doesn't harm your beneficial insects. Some examples here that you should be able to identify for the exam are the minute pirate bug, the tamarixia wasp, ladybird beetles, and lace wings. And for the lace wings and ladybird beetles, we show both the larvae and the adult. The larvae are often the ones that eat the most of your pests. Citrus leaf miner eggs are inserted in between the layers of the leaf and the larvae eat between the layers of the leaf protected from any kind of sprays until they emerge as adults. There are several different types of leaf miners that can cause problems on many crops, but the li citrus leaf miner is one you will need to identify in the exam. Citrus scab is a disease that causes scabby growth on the fruit and diagnostic warty bumps on the leaves and fruit.
This is another one you'll need to identify. Citrus canker is a bacterial disease that causes lesions on the fruit that can get kind of scabby looking and have that yellow halo. It causes lesions on the leaves that also have a kind of yellow halo. And this is an important pest to citrus. Citrus greening, also called HLB or Huanglong Bing, is a very serious citrus disease caused by a bacteria. It causes mottled leaves, corky veins, a yellow stain beneath the calyx button, which often causes the fruit to drop early, and may cause distorted fruit. You will also need to identify some weeds on the exam. Crabgrass here is a common summer annual grass weed. Florida pusley is a prostrate and spreading summer annual with branched hairy stems. The leaves are opposite, oval shaped, and somewhat thickened. The flowers are tubular, white, and clustered at the ends of the branches. Johnson grass is a coarse perennial grass with long, thick, scaly, sharp, pointed rhizomes. The stems are erect, forming dense stands up to six feet tall. The leaf blades have a prominent white midvein and hairs at the base of the upper surface. Bermuda grass is often called devil grass because of its creeping perennial weed habit and the way it will take over areas with those rhizomes. Pest management is accomplished by either prevention, suppression, or eradication. Prevention example is using nematode resistant rootstock or sanitation where you prevent the pest from entering your orchard. Suppression would be the common pest control method used to suppress pest populations, not eliminate them. You have to monitor the pest population and make control decisions to keep the populations at an acceptable level. Eradication is a total elimination of a pest from an area. It is not practical over large areas because it's so expensive and has limited success. Government agencies may conduct large-scale eradication projects to try to eliminate exotic pests that threaten public health or economy. Pest control decisions need to be made based on pest populations and economics. The economic threshold is the population density at which control action should be started to prevent an increasing pest population from reaching the economic injury level. The economic injury level is the population density where the losses caused by the pest would be greater than the cost of controlling the pest or economic damage. An example would be the protocols for mite control in citrus that are based on interacting factors of temperature, humidity, population levels, tree vigor, intended market, and time of year. There are many different pest management methods, and a proper integrated pest management program for your orchard should include as many of these as possible. The first is host resistance, where your crop plant has been selected and bred for resistance to as many pests and pathogens as possible. Biological control is the use of living organisms to help control your pests. For example, using predatory mites to control insects in your orchard. Cultural controls include all types of cultural methods that you may use to control pests. This could be tillage, using mulch or plastic mulch to control weeds. There are many different types of cultural controls that you can implement. Mechanical controls are mechanical ways of controlling pests. This could be using fencing or screening to keep out pests. Regulatory control is when the government uses regulations to control pests. And finally, chemical control is used as a last resort, but sometimes may be the only resort to control your pests. Compared with other crops, Fruit crops have very few registered pesticides. Chemical pest control consists mostly of protectants that must be applied to protect the crop plant before the 
pest organism is in the orchard. New chemistries are safer for humans in the environment and have less effect on beneficial organisms in our orchards. Compared with other crops, fruit trees have fewer registered pesticides, so they are only used on pests with significant effect on tree growth and yield. There are concerns with chemical methods, and that's why we like to use integrated pest management using other methods before we use chemical methods. Some of these concerns are bees and other beneficial insects that have been harmed by overuse of insecticides. Copper toxicity is another problem. Copper used to control diseases can build up in the soil in the environment of the orchard. There's also concern with groundwater contamination of pesticides that get infiltrated into our groundwater. There's tank mix compatibility that is a problem when incompatible pesticides are mixed together and result in pesticides that are ineffective. There are maximum residue limits that have been set by the government to ensure that the residues of chemicals on our fruit are safe for people to eat. And then there are effects of water quality factors. The water quality in your orchard can have an important impact on the efficacy of your sprays. High pH water, pH above seven, can chemically interact with sprays, making them ineffective. For example, carbamate and organophosphate insecticides undergo alkaline hydrolysis with high pH water. At pH of eight to nine, they lose their effectiveness completely. Hard water has excess calcium and magnesium that can tie up chemicals. Glyphosate mixed with hard water will be ineffective. So mixing ammonium sulfate to the hard water before adding the glyphosate will tie up the excess calcium and magnesium and allow the herbicide to be effective. Some nitrate-based nutritionals reduce the pH and contribute to phytotoxicity and affect other compounds in a tank mix. For example, solubility of copper. Acidifiers and buffering agents may also be added to overcome issues, but read the labels and know your water so that you can be prepared. Pest resistance to chemicals can occur when a tiny proportion of the pest population survives a pesticide application due to its genetic makeup. Then the survivors reproduce and the population expands. On the right hand side, you can see this illustrated with the first generation of insects on a leaf before the pesticide application. That one red insect just happens to have a genetic makeup that makes it resistant to that pesticide application. After that application, we can see that we have one red insect and two green ones that somehow avoided contact with the insecticide. They all reproduce, and in a later generation, on the lower left-hand side there, we have four red and four green. If we apply that same pesticide again, we're gonna kill more of those green ones, but we still have no impact on the red. So eventually we have mostly red population that is resistant to that pesticide. And these will continue to reproduce until we rotate with another type of pesticide. The key to avoiding pesticide resistance is to rotate the pesticide mode of action. The mode of action can be found on the top of the label where it tells you the group of the insecticide. So for example, here we have Safari, which is a group 4A insecticide. We can make sure that we rotate pesticide mode of actions with our next pesticide being from a different group. Some pesticides will have different names, but they will still be in that same group. So it is important to check for the group and make sure that you don't repeat the same group over and over again or you will build up pest resistance. Worker protection standards apply to fruit production. They are designed to protect agricultural workers who are people involved in the production of the agricultural plants and the pesticide handlers, which are people mixing, loading, or applying pesticides or doing other tasks that involve direct contact with pesticides. In other words, worker protection standards are designed to protect employees of farms, forests, nurseries, and greenhouses. 
pesticides under the jurisdiction of the worker protection standard will have an agricultural use requirements box in the labeling, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. Complete reference for the worker protection standards are provided by the US EPA publication, How to Comply with the Worker Protection Standard for Agricultural Pesticides, What Employers Need to Know, and you can find this on the web at this website. In all cases, pesticide labeling supersedes the worker protection standards requirements. Pest control in tree fruit utilizes a variety of application equipment. Chemigation is one of the most economic ways to apply pesticide because the pesticide is put through the irrigation system. Air blast sprayers may also be used to apply sprays throughout a large canopy. Boom sprayers might be used to apply herbicides to the ground level. Handheld spray guns may be used to apply to individual trees and granule applicators may be used to apply to the soil. Nozzle selection is important for your application equipment. The flow rate depends on the tip orifice size and operating pressure of that nozzle. From softest to hardest, we have nylon, brass, aluminum, hardened stainless steel, and ceramic, which is the longest lasting and best for abrasive materials. Air induction or venturi nozzles create coarser droplets that are less prone to spray drift when compared to finer droplets produced by conventional hollow cone nozzles. Coarser droplets formed by the use of air induction and a large exit orifice. Applications from air induction hollow cones are as good as conventional hollow cones. If you look into the upper right hand side there, we have water sensitive paper that was used to look at deposition of spray from an air induction and from turbo drop twin fan. You could see that the coarser droplets on the air induction are still covering the area well. Some conditions where coarser droplets are not a good fit though, or if you have a very dense canopy because you don't get as good a penetration. If you have a very wide canopy because these droplets will fall out earlier because they're larger. Or when you're using low volume and disease pressure is high. If using an air blast sprayer, you'll want to consider the size and shape of your canopy. With large trees, you'll want to direct two thirds to the upper half and one third to the bottom, as shown in the illustration on the right. With smaller trees or a larger air blast sprayer, you can use half and half, a uniform nozzle arrangement. To minimize spray wastage, you should consider sprayer air deflectors, nozzle orientation, and adjust the number of nozzles to match the size and shape of the canopy. With air blast sprayers, a lower spray volume can deposit as much or more pesticide as higher volumes with less spray runoff, more uniform spray distribution, and smaller droplet sizes with the smaller orifice nozzles. However, as volume decreases and your speed increases, the variability of spray distribution within the canopy and the drift potential will increase. 250 gallons per acre at two and a half miles per hour are a good compromise for most pests, except for some scale insects. Chemigation is the application of chemicals through the irrigation system. The rate is regulated by adjusting the flow rate of the pump that injects a pesticide concentrate. The pesticide label will say if it can or cannot be used in chemigation. You want to apply chemicals only when needed and in the required amount. Chemigation minimizes environmental pollution and uses less chemical per application. However, in Florida state law, a backflow prevention equipment is required to be installed and maintained on irrigation systems used for chemigation. It is Florida law that areas irrigated with chemical toxicity category one, which are danger poison with skull and crossbones products, must be posted with warning signs at points of entry and other highly visible sites when any part of the treated area is within 300 feet of sensitive areas where people may be exposed or when the treated area is open to the public. Signs must remain until foliage is dried and the soil surface is dry.
Now we'll move on to the calculations that will be required on the exam. You will receive a copy of formula and conversions for exam calculations with the exam and a nozzle selection chart, a portion of which is seen below. The calculations I will lead you through are all word problems on the exam, but I have changed the numbers. Learning how to answer these questions will help you to pass the exam and hopefully help you to do a better job in calculating your applications. In this first question, the capacity of the sprayer tank is 200 gallons. The sprayer is calibrated to deliver 20 gallons per acre, and the label says to apply three pints of formulation per acre. So the question is, how many gallons of product do you need to mix a full tank? Well, if you have 20 gallons per acre and a 200 gallon tank, then that tank will cover 10 acres. The problem says that you need three pints per acre. So three pints times 10 acres equals 30 pints. You have to provide the answer in gallons. So we divide 30 pints by eight pints per gallon to get 3.75 gallons. That is our answer. Sometimes the answers in the multiple choice will be slightly rounded differently. Choose the closest answer. In this problem, you need to determine the area of a triangle in acres. The question is how much acreage is present in a triangular shaped grove that measures 3,000 feet long along its longest side and measures 3,900 feet across at its widest point. Well, the area of a triangle formula is on the sheet that will be handed out with the exam. And it is length times width divided by two. So we have 3,000 times 900 divided by two, which gives us 1,350,000 square feet. Well, we need to provide the area in acres and there are 43,560 square feet in an acre. So we divide 1,350,000 by the 43,560 feet, square feet to get 30.9 acres in this triangular field. In this calculation, we need to determine the volume of a cylindrical tank. The question is, how many cubic feet are in a cylindrical tank that has a diameter of nine feet and a height of 12 feet? Well, the formula for the volume of a cylinder is provided in the formula page that you will be given at the exam. The formula for this is the height times pi, the constant of 3.14, times one half the diameter squared. We're given that the diameter is nine feet. So one half of that would be 4.5 feet. And 4.5 times 4.5 is that one half a diameter squared. So the answer is 12 feet, which is the height of the cylinder times 3.14, that constant number pi, times the four and a half by four and a half feet. That number is 763.02 cubic feet. And once again, the multiple choice answers will probably be 763 rounded from that true answer. Just select the answer that is closest to your answer. This question asks, how much Roundup should be mixed into a three gallon backpack sprayer at a herbicide concentration of 2% to spot treat weed patches? Well, 2% means two one hundredths or 0 0.02. So all we need to do is multiply 0 0.02 times the three gallons to get 0 0.06 gallons. The answer will be in ounces rather than gallons though. So we need to convert the formula sheet that is provided with the exam tells you that there are 128 ounces in a gallon. So we multiply 0 0.06 gallons times the 128 ounces in a gallon to get the answer of 7.68 ounces. Remember that the multiple choice answers may be rounded, so it won't be exactly this in your choices. This next calculation seems very complicated until you remember that you've got that formula sheet that's going to help you here. The problem is involving the specific gravity and how the spray solution coming out of the nozzles is going to be different for water versus your spray solution. 
So the question is, if a spray solution weighs 10 pounds per gallon and the desired output from the nozzles is five gallons per minute, what would be the equivalent gallons per minute for water when water weighs 8.34 pounds per gallon? So remember, we've got that formula on our formula sheet. Gallons per minute of water, which is the nozzle capacity for water, equals the gallons per minute of solution, or the nozzle capacity for the solution, times a correction factor. And the correction factor is the square root of the specific gravity of the solution. Don't worry, we've got those formulas. Specific gravity of the solution is 10 pounds of, per gallon of that solution, and divided by 8.34 pounds per gallon of water. That gives you a specific gravity of 1.199, which is 10 divided by 8.34. We can then calculate our correction factor, which is the square root of that specific gravity, or the square root of 1.199. Hopefully your calculator has a square root function on it, so you can determine that the square root of 1.199 is 1.095. We can now plug our numbers into the formula where the gallons per minute of water, which is what we want, equals five gallons per minute, which is what we were given, times that 1.095, which is a correction factor that we calculated. That equals 5.475 gallons per minute. This next calculation is to calibrate an air blast sprayer. So the question is, an air blast sprayer is driven over a 300 foot test strip. The time required to complete three test runs is measured at 75 seconds, 73 seconds, and 76 seconds. What is the sprayer's actual travel speed in miles per hour? So first we have to get the average time it's taking to run that 300 foot test strip. So that would be 75 plus 73 plus 76 divided by three for an average of 74.66 seconds. Now we want that in minutes, so we're gonna divide it by 60 to get 1.24 minutes. So there's 60 seconds in a minute. So now we know that we're going 300 feet in 1.24 minutes. And if we divide that, we get 241.9 feet per minute. Now we need miles per hour. So we have to use a constant. That 88 is a constant from your formula page. It is 88 feet per minute equals one mile per hour. Um, so we do 241.9 feet per minute divided by 88. That gives us 2.75 miles per hour, the answer to the question. This next calculation is probably the most complicated on the exam because we're looking to set an air blast sprayer with different nozzles so that we get five nozzles in the upper half, five nozzles in the lower half with slightly different um, spray types so that we can get that more spray up into the top part of the canopy. So the question is, an applicator wants to spray 200 gallons per acre at four miles per hour using an air blast sprayer. The tree rows are set at 25 foot spacing. The sprayer used 10 T-Jet ceramic disc core nozzles per side of the manifold, five in the upper half, five in the lower half of the manifold, and the desired nozzle pressure is 200 PSI. The manifold will be set up so that spray will be directed to two thirds of the upper canopy and one third to the lower portion of the tree. Select the appropriate nozzles for the application using the nozzle selection chart. This sounds complicated, so we'll just work through it one step at a time. So first we need to determine the output of the sprayer in gallons per minute by using the equation in the formula chart. And it's gallons per minute divided by side equals gallons per acre times miles per hour times the row spacing divided by a constant of 990. So we plug in our numbers that we know. It's 200 gallons times four miles per hour times 25 foot row spacing, divide that by 990 and we get 20.2 gallons per minute. So next, we need to determine the discharge rate from each of the nozzles in the upper and lower portions of the nozzle manifold. Now you want to remember that we're gonna have two thirds to the top, one third to the bottom, and two thirds equals 0.67. One third equals 0.33. So for the upper part, we have 0 0.67 times that 20.2 gallons per minute for the total, and that equals 13.534 gallons per minute. 
the lower part, which is going to be one third of that 20.2. We're going to do 1.33 times 20.2, and that equals 6.66 gallons per minute. So those two, the 13.534 and 6.66, add up to the 20.2 gallons per minute. Next, the applicator will be using five nozzles in the upper half and five nozzles in the lower half of the manifold. So we've got to divide those two numbers by five. So we have 13.534 divided by five, which equals 2.71 gallon per minute per nozzle. And the five lower ones are 6.66 divided by five, which equals 1.33 gallons per minute. Now we're going to use the T-Jet nozzle chart, and I'll take it in the next slide, and look for the numbers that are closest, have the closest match to those numbers under the 200 PSI column, since we know that the nozzle pressure is 200 PSI. And if we go to the next slide, we can see in this nozzle selection chart that the five upper nozzles, which are at 2.71 gallons per minute, are probably closest here the, to the 2.46 under the 200 PSI column, and that traces back to the D6 DC56 nozzle. Now the five lower nozzles were 1.33 gallons per minute, and the closest number for that one is here the 1.23, and that traces back to the D4 DC56. So we've chosen the two nozzles that we will need to set up this sprayer. This next calculation is about calibrating an air blast sprayer so that you know how many gallons per acre that you are applying. So the question is, an applicator operates an air blast sprayer with a full tank of water over a test course that is 400 feet long with a swath width of 25 feet. That's the distance between the tree rows. His sprayer's tank capacity is 250 gallons. Now upon he sprays out and then he refills the tank and he, 10 gallons of water were needed to refill the tank to the capacity. So we know that he used 10 gallons. How many gallons of water per acre is the air plus sprayer applying? So the gallons per acre equals gallons needed to refill the tank divided by the acres sprayed. So we just need to figure out how many acres were sprayed in, a, in an area that is 400 feet by 25 feet. So 400 times 25, which is length times width, is the area of a rectangle, and that gives us 10,000 square feet. That is the area. However, we need it in acres. So 10,000 square feet divided by the constant of 43560 square feet in an acre, and that gives us 0 0.2295 acres. So now we can plug into our equation. The gallons per acre equals 10 gallons over or divided by 0 0.23 acres, and that gives us 43.5 gallons per acre. The next question is pretty straightforward using a formula from your formula sheet. The question is, an applicator is in the process of selecting nozzles for a herbicide sprayer. The desired volume is to apply 30 gallons per acre using a boom sprayer that has nozzles spaced 12 inches apart. The sprayer will be traveling at a speed of 3 miles per hour. Determine the sprayer's average nozzle output in gallons per minute. So the formula for gallons per minute is gallons per acre times the miles per hour times the width divided by a constant of 5940. We plug in our numbers of 30 gallons per acre 3 miles per hour, 12 inch width, and divided by 5940, and we get 0 0.18 gallons per minute. The next problem is trying to find out how much dry product you need to add to your tank. So the question is, based on the following, determine how much of a dry product should be added to make a full tank of spray if the application rate will be 3 ounces per acre. The speed to make the application is 4 miles per hour. The nozzle spacing on the boom is 12 inches. The average nozzle output is 0.25 gallons per minute. And the spray tank capacity is 250 gallons. Now we have a formula for gallons per acre, which equals gallons per minute times 5940 as constant. And then you divide that by the 
product of miles per hour times width. So that plugging in numbers is 0.25 times 5940. And then we will divide that by 4 times 12. So do your multiplication first and then do the division and we get 30.9 gallons per acre. So we know that the tank will take 250 gallons. If we divide that 250 gallons by the 30.9 gallons per acre, we get that we can treat 8.09 acres with a full tank. So the full tank is 250 gallons. We know that the gallons per acre that we're going to be applying is 30.9. Just divide that and we find out that we have 8.09 acres. So the amount of product to add to the tank is three ounces per acre. So 8.09 acres times three ounces per acre equals 24.3 ounces. However, this is a dry product, not a liquid. So we need to use weight, not volume. And 24.3 ounces divided by 16 ounces in a pound equals 1.52 pounds. We have now finished all of the calculation types that you will be asked on the exam. If you have any questions, because I did have to go over that pretty fast, the, quest the calculations are all explained in detail in the study guide for Ag Tree Crop. Now the next section I'm going to go over is label exercise. In each exam, you will be given a label and ask questions about that label. And I will go over the types of questions you'll be asked. So you should be familiar with how to look at a label and read a label. The first question is, what is group UN acaricide up in the right hand corner of, a, of this label mean? Well, that gray square in the middle is where we report the mode of action. And in this case, UN means it's unknown. They're not quite sure how this acaricide kills things, but that could be a number for the mode of action for whatever the chemical is that you're using. The second question, what is the common name of the active ingredient? Well, we see that Acromite 50WS is the brand name. The common name is biphenazate. And then the chemical name is that hydrazine carboxylic acid 2,4-methoxy 1,1-biphenyl 3-yl-1-methylester. <laughs> but the common name is biphenazate. The signal word here is caution, and you will see this on the front of every label in large letters. It'll be either caution, warning, or danger, and then danger with the skull and crossbones and poison. In this case, acromite is a signal word of caution. The fourth question, how much active ingredient in a percent is in this product? And we look right up there at the active ingredient percent by weight, and it tells you that biphenazate is 50% by weight. The other ingredients are 50% for a total of 100, but the active ingredient is 50%. And finally on this page, the EPA registration number. And the EPA registration number is at that bottom. It is on every label has their own EPA registration number. It is important. It's like the batch number for that chemical. And if there's ever any problems, you will need to know that one. So in this case, the EPA registration number is 400-503. The label that you will have is several pages and there will be questions that cover various pages on the label. So you will need to learn to look for where that kind of information is found. The next question here is, this product is toxic to what? You would find that under environmental hazards. The environmental hazards section is found on all labels. And reading this one, you can see that this pesticide is toxic to birds, estuarine, and marine invertebrates and fish. The next question, what order should this product be placed in tank when mixing with other products? Well, the mixing instructions is included on every label. You just need to find that heading, mixing instructions. And you can see on this one that the order is other water soluble bags, wettable powders, dry flowables, liquid flowables, liquids, and emulsifiable concentrates. This information will be different for every label and you just need to find mixing instructions to find out the details. Another question might be the restricted entry interval. The restricted entry interval is the amount of time that must pass from application to allowing people out into the field. This is the kind of information that you would find under agricultural use requirements, 
which is the information for worker protection standards. You can find here agricultural use requirements, do not enter or allow the worker entry into treated areas during the restricted entry interval of 12 hours. Any exceptions are listed under the use instructions. Further in the label, there is information about use instructions. What kind of crops are covered with this chemical, how much needs to be applied for different chem crops and different situations. So another question might be, what is the maximum amount per year that can be applied to citrus? And if you look at this table for the crop and you find citrus, you find out how much acromite can be applied per acre and you see that its total number of sprays per year is once. So the answer to this one is one spray per year of 12 to 16 fluid ounces per acre. And this is, again, look at that, non-bearing crops only. That's the only place where we found citrus in this label. Now the next question is what is the pre-harvest interval for avocado? And looking at this, we find that the use instructions for this is a different table for bearing crops. That's the only place where we found avocado. And looking across, we can see avocado, the amount per acre is 0.75 to one pound. The minimum gallons per acre, the chemigation acre inches of water, the total number of sprays per season, the minimum days between application, and what the question is asking, the harvest days after application, which is pre-harvest interval, PHI, and we see that is seven. This is the kind of information that you can find in the tables in a label. This presentation was created and produced by Juanita Papano, the University of Florida IFAS Extension Commercial Fruit Production Agent. I hope you have found it helpful.